Okay. Thank you, uh, Leontine, for your uh, flaming introduction. Yes, I will do it in English. The translators are still having food. I didn't. <laughs> I was a bit late. Well, a very small plate. But um, nevertheless, I'm honored to be here and to be one out of the two speakers who presented already earlier in the framework of the Museum Global Project, <coughs> along with Nora Sternfield. And I guess that's why she's not here at the moment. Um, so I should thank all of the organizers of the Museum Global Project for inviting me twice, and specifically Peter Schuller and the Education Department of the NOA for accepting this paper. I realize that I will say a lot of things that have been told already in the panels before me, and I will repeat them here, but differently. I will also repeat some of my lecture given in Berlin a month ago, but with a different argument. I've done several projects in the realm of art and globalization at the Stedelijk Museum Amsterdam and in its project space, Stedelijk Museum Bureau Amsterdam. I came to realize over yesterday's panel how schizophrenic we museum people actually are. One side of the museum is conformative, caring for the money, imposing aesthetic standards on passive consumers, whereas the other side, as Milena made clear, pursues audience participation, etc. Across all of this, we also run project spaces and global projects. So it's not strange that these always remain projects and never materialize as firm policy. That was my introduction. My project, uh, the project that I uh, kind of led uh, artistically, uh, global collaborations aimed at collaborative projects in regions for which a modern art museum usually has no eye. But rather than perceiving globalization as art, uh, uh, globalization in art as a homogenization of the art market, we thought of it as a process of fragmentation and localization. Why would we be interested in globalization if it only produces sameness? So we collaborated with different kinds of institutions in various places in the world, not so much with the aim to acquire works and add some sort of checkbox of nationalities to the collection of the Stedelijk Museum, but rather to share curatorial authority and to exchange expertise and ideas. So that was very much the initiative of the project space where such a defiant practice is perhaps fostered, but it does not make that much impression on the museum itself. In order to annoy the museum institution also a little bit with the idea of possible paradigm changes in the event of a global perspective, we used slots and spaces in the museum's exhibition program as well as in its public program and in its educational program. And I'm not talking about the educational program now because that will be two other lectures. As long as you talk or write about globalization in the context of the museum, there's no problem. Global programs always tend to stay at the margin. They are perceived as peripheral matter. There is a sense of what globalization might mean for the museum, yet these remain in the realm of ideas and ideals. There is a general feeling that some justice needs to be done towards art history, diversity, art markets. But globalization is also an overwhelming term, an overwhelming framework with which any art or museum expertise from within the museum hardly can cope. Catching up with appropriate expertise 
or even determining what kind of expertise is actually needed here is beyond the horizon of most modern art museums that are swallowed up by exhibition deadlines and quantitative targets. So there was another introduction. And I became aware of that when I made an opinionated display of the collection of the museum, which was the exhibition How Far, How Near. It featured, it featured artworks from all disciplines of the Stedelijk collection throughout the 20 and 21st centuries, including photography and graphic design. The starting point of my argument was that the modern art museum collection can be visualized as a sedimentation of a world order. Although the modern art museum thrives on notions of the historical avant-garde and the revolutionary potential of art, it itself is complacent with mainstream geopol geopolitics. So I used a significant selection of documentary photography and posters from the museum to make the point that the world outside of the NATO, outside of NATO countries, outside the democratic and capitalist sphere, that is, was a confirmation of the rest of the world as either totalitarian or stricken with poverty. The rest of the world was a no-go area. These second and third worlds were therefore completely ignored as possible interesting centers of art by the modern art museum. And it's very special, specific for the collection of the Stedelijk Museum to have such a huge uh, photography collection, as well as poster collection that I kind of mixed uh, on a presentation uh, on a wall around the staircase. So you can see here how such works were displayed as a public archive on the wall, a proof of the cultural bias underlying the modern art museum. The stereotypical other is kept at a distance. It's not even a footnote. At least such is the message that radiates from these collections. Now, of course, this is not a very positive message. Huh? Uh, within the museum, it of course also created some resistance. The photo department of the museum, for instance, favored a more positive narrative, a frame of progress of documentary photography. And my reading of their collection was seen as critical and post-colonial. My argument about the exclusivity of the museum was mainly historical, but the whole process may be deeply aware of the ambivalent function of a curator in the museum. This is not only the one safeguarding objects and building expertise around them, but also a matter of gatekeeping, forcing narratives, neglecting other narratives, and even censoring if that helps the case. Given the endless positivism with which museums tend to endow their policies, my narrative, of course, also had to end positively. Contemporary works in my exhibition demonstrated that art from formerly neglected parts of the world are infiltrating into the museum's lingering preservation of a world order that has passed. In other words, we can forget the past if we would only open our eye to the challenges of globalization. <coughs> but what exactly is the challenge? Coincidentally, globalization manifested itself in Dutch society at the time I was preparing the exhibition. And I don't mean the abstractions of global finance here. It was a very concrete and flaming debate, now commonly known as the Black Meat Controversy. It started in 2013, when an artist formally objected against this kind of Santa Claus parades, which are very familiar in the Netherlands every month of November. His objection concerned the Black Pete servant, which you can see here on the photographs, which are usually in these parades, <coughs> and whose dress and blackface are considered as racial stereotypes stemming from a colonial past. 
our country's thriving slave trade and its colonialism, which actually lasted until 1975, slaps back in the face of the nation today with this still ongoing black peat controversy. And it started in 2013 and it's still not over. The position of blackness in the Netherlands became an inevitable topic in my exhibition. This was especially so because of its argument that the colonial past and the neo-colonial geopolitical world order marked the modernist identity of the museum. An identity, I repeat, that shuns a justified imagination of the world in general and the art world in particular. So this work by Iris Kensmill, a Dutch artist from Surinamese descent, was donated to the museum just before my exhibition and became extremely relevant in the context of the Black Peat issue, and even more so in the light of the Ferguson riots in the United States one month before the opening of the show. Gottfried Donker, a British Ghanaian artist, produced a work that specifically suggested the lingering relations between colonialism, slavery, black peat stereotypes, and black poverty in South Africa, which was also once a Dutch colony. So Quincy Gario, you see here on this photo, was the artist who instigated the black peat debate with a performance called Black Peat is Racism. And here you see what happened in 2012. <coughs> this was the situation in 2014. And through his activist performances, he has exercised a tremendous influence on the public debate in the Netherlands that, as I said, still continues. So we thought it was a good idea to commission him a performance in the framework of the How Far, How Near exhibition. And this performance happened to be attended by a member of parliament. Oi. It was a prominent figurehead from the famous Freedom Party, the PVV. It was not the one in front, but the one behind him, actually. <laughs> now, for those who don't know the PVV, it sees a decline of Dutch culture everywhere, and it regards itself as the protector of the traditional black peat figure. Following the performance at the Stedelijk Museum, the PVV filed an official query in Parliament about the amount of subsidy that was given to Quincy Gario for his performance at the Stedelijk Museum. Now, National Parliament is not at all responsible for such matters, but the point was made, and it reverberated in national press, reinforcing an underlying assumption that a black artist who addresses a roaming specter of colonialism should not do so. He should simply shut up. What was equally stunning is that the museum remained silent about it as it felt not inclined to say any word in defense of the artist. Now, in my lecture in Berlin, I pointed at the political situation of the Netherlands at the moment, uh, where the PVV, the Dutch version of the AFD, uh, has become a major phenomenon in the Dutch political firmament, and it's mainly known for its constant bashing of ethnic minorities, especially the Islam, Islamic minorities, and by doing so conjures up a vision of Dutchness that is white. Yet, in this fragmentary political landscape we have in the Netherlands today, it has led to a serious response with the rise with the rise of a political party that fosters cultural diversity and sees that as a fundamental part of contemporary globalized and creative society in the Netherlands. And it's exactly the opposite of the Freedom Party. Huh? I already emphasized the importance of this antagonism, this conflict for the political arena in democracy in general. I should credit thinkers like Hannah Arendt or Claude Lefort, and more recently, Chantal Mouffe and Jacques Rancière, who see this, the importance of antagonism in the public art institutions. Public antagonism forms the arena in which the gravity of power 
is not fixed, but it hovers in a sphere of constant juxtaposition of ideas and fundamentally divergent values. Today, this is more obvious. As communities format and manifest themselves, more easily than ever, thanks to social media. The party only uh, communicates through Facebook. Huh? Although self-centered, they fight with opponents in a continuous political arena. And ultimately, it leads to new equilibriums. Now let me focus on antagonism in the context of the modern art museum. When I was in Berlin, I, I encountered this show in Museum Berggrün, where I saw the exhibition of classical modern art along the work of contemporary American artist George Kondo. Well, it's a very witty exhibition, Kondo next to the modernist that inspired him. But who is confronting what here? This is not the antagonism that I mean. The work of Kondo and the modernists allude to one and the same aesthetic regime, a regime that is carefully maintained and cultivated by the modern art museum. But antagonism implies the confrontation of different aesthetic regimes. The anti-Black Pete performance of Quincy Gario, for example, is hardly considered art in the mainstream aesthetic regime. That is because instead, it addresses the urgent concern of a community that is formed around that concern. And that is not the museum community. In the view of the aesthetic regime of the museum, the work of Gario is not considered art, but activism. On the other hand, the narratives of the modern art at the museum are not considered of any aesthetical relevance to the concerns of Quincy Gario. Now, it does not happen very often that a contemporary artist brings discussion in parliament, so I was really thrilled to have that uh, situation because I really regarded it as one of those rare avant-gardistic moments you'd never find in a modern art museum anymore, except historically. So, in the project space, an invitation to Aboriginal artist Richard Bell led to a full exploitation of the issue of racism and the minority issues within art institutions. The space was practically given over to Bell, who turned it into a group show. It also gave plenty of opportunity for this group and the black community and the migrate, migrant community in Amsterdam to, uh, um, to uh, express their dissent over, for example, the Stedelijk Museum, which was uh, regarded a racist institution. It became quite public that this creative black class in Amsterdam did not at all feel represented or taken seriously by any museum institution. Many of them see their careers unfolding independent from mainstream cultural institutions, but that, don't, but that doesn't bother them anyway. But I'd say that we need this dissent for the museum to become an arena for antagonism and opposition. A museum not only centered around the objects it already has, but actively engages with audiences and communities that are overlooked. In my example, it was the black community, and in general, the migratory class in Amsterdam, which already make half of the city at the moment, and they are ignored by the museum world, so there's a huge discrep discrepancy here. And I'm not only talking about the cosmopolitan classes, or LGBT, <laughs> Where do we situate in our museum the average PVV, AFD, or Donald Trump voter? Museums instead try to match that kind of populism with reaching out to the largest audiences possible. But curatorially speaking, or artistically speaking, this is quite cynical. And it does not do any justice to the museum as an important instrument of emancipation. So why would we not just simply engage all kinds of different communities and groups along the lines of their real concerns? That is what globalization brings us. After the global building craze, 
incited by global finance that brought hundreds of new modern art museums all over the world and all the others beautiful renovations and expansions, we finally have to face the globally networked and dissent oriented audiences at our doorstep. This may not sound very revolutionary to those in the educational department, but I'm talking here about the curatorial endeavor. <coughs> Rather than to sit on our collections and reproduce familiar tropes, it will become a matter of tapping right into those social networks of today and become a place of antagonism in order to find out how our museums can remain socially relevant. And this process will certainly kill some of our most cherished darlings. So we better call that innovation or disruption, and then it's probably much easier to do the trick. But the main question for me is actually, are you ready for the barbarians? Thank you. Thank you.